God bless you. Hey, summer finally came, didn't it? We were wondering in January if we were ever going to see any warm weather, but uh, thank God it has come. And we hope you had a wonderful 4th of July, and uh, we're blessed, and uh, you had a great time with your family. And we thank God, as Pastor Rosemary said, for the freedoms that we have in America to worship the Lord and, and to serve Him. You know, uh, Larry is from Oklahoma, you were saying, right? And there's a little bit of um, Indian heritage in, in your, in your uh, uh, background. And um, I was telling him before the service that one of our Bible colleges is in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, in the Bible college there, there was a uh, young guy who was part Chickasaw and part uh, uh, Paiute. And he married a wife who was uh, Potwatomi. And they had a child, and the chick, and the uh, child came out chicken pot pie. So, I, I don't know. It's terrible, isn't it? That's probably not even politically correct today, is it? Huh? Yeah. yeah see, chicken pot pie, Chickasaw pie, you and pot water. I guess I should have said pot water me first, chicken pie. Uh, okay, all right. Better, better get to preaching, quick, right? Hey, I do need to mention also that um, next Sunday evening, July the 14th, we'll be having a fellowship for Pastor uh, Lawrence and Brittany. As you know, they're going to be opening a new church here in Decatur, and so we wanted to provide an opportunity for us just to thank them for their years of service here and give you an opportunity to come by and and, uh, hug their neck, and uh, so we're going to be doing that next Sunday evening, uh, July the 14th at 6 p.m., and you're welcome to bring a, a card or um, a love offering if you'd like to do that. And um, that'll be next Sunday. So we want you to be aware of that. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, overflowing. Just sounds good, doesn't it? Overflowing. How many of you want to live the overflowing life? I like everything about overflow. And, and uh, Pastor Rob, who pastors our East Campus, has already had an overflowing experience today, right? He's Spilt the coffee. How many times that has happened to me, right? But, um, you know, in fact, uh, Rosemary can substantiate what I'm going to tell you. I, it doesn't matter what part of the world I'm in. It could be here in America. It could be in Decatur. It can be, you know, on the other side of the globe. It can be in India, or Europe, wherever we go. Whenever uh, my coffee gets brought to me, it always has been spilled, and there's coffee in the saucer, and I always get, it doesn't happen hardly to anybody else, but my coffee is always spilled, isn't it, overflowing. And they'll say, well, I'm really sorry I spilled your coffee, so don't worry about it. It's just because I have the overflowing blessing in my life, and the double portion blessing is on my life. And they go, what? I said, oh, it happens all over the world. And I uh, I think it's just a little sign for me, and, and not I'm not special. God wants that for every one of you. In fact, that's the whole goal of today is God wants your life to be an overflowing life, not just plenty and not just halfway filled, but I believe God wants us overflowing. I believe that one of the problems we have in the Christian life sometimes is we're trying to do uh, what God has called us to do, and we're on empty, right? Or we're only half filled or a third filled. But God wants our life to be an abundant life, an overflowing life, filled with His presence, filled with His Word, filled with His goodness. And you can do a whole lot more ministry when your cup is flowing over, overflowing, amen, rather than you're just trying to hold on to what little bit that you have. I'm glad we serve a God who's the God of the overflow, and He wants your life to be more than abundant. In fact, In your outline you have today, one of the scriptures we're using is Psalm 23. I'm going to read it to you out of the contemporary English version that says, You treat me to a feast while my enemies watch. You honor me as your guest, and you fill my cup until it overflows. Amen. Isn't it wonderful? That's a beautiful metaphor and picture of what God wants to do in each of our lives. Now, we probably all have enemies. We probably all have somebody Uh, who would like for horrible things to happen to us. That's just the way life is. But aren't you glad that God's in charge of all of that, and He stands between us and our enemies? And uh, if God is on your side, it doesn't really matter who, what other enemy you might have, right? Because you're going to be successful and come through, and God's going to work in your life. 
But, and it, but it says that you honor me as your guest, and actually we could say as a spatial guest, and you fill my cup till it overflows. I want you to know God wants that for every child of his. Can I get an amen on that? He wants your cup to be filled and overflowing, and it's out of that overflowing life that you can, you can make a, a, a real impact on people around you. Now, I have uh, alluded to this scripture a time or two. In fact, I mentioned it uh, last Sunday at the end of the service and a little bit on Wednesday night. But coming back across the country, when we, Rosemary and I, were celebrating our Jubilee year, we've been married 50 years, so we're calling it our Jubilee year. So we're, we're really enjoying just doing some special things. And as we're coming back across the country, I felt like the Lord spoke to me that many times what happens in the natural world is a clue to what God is wanting to do in the supernatural. And we have all kind of been bemoaning the fact that we've had all these floods in um, the Midwest, and it has kind of stopped, you know, so many things in the beginning of the year. But I felt like the Lord was speaking to me that it really is God's plan and God's desire that He wants to send a spiritual flood to America. Amen? A spiritual flood, a flood of His presence, a flood of His power. How many of you know if the Holy Spirit's will is done in everyone's life, things are going to be all right, right? Your marriage is going to be okay. Your job is going to be okay. Your mind is going to be okay. Your body is going to be okay if the Holy Spirit really does what He wants to do in every one of our lives. And we want Him to do that. We need that flood. Can I get an amen today? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could see a flood of the Spirit come into the Midwest that would just stop everybody in their tracks and say, you know, when the flood comes, you're not in control. The flood's in control. Wouldn't it be wonder, wonderful if a flood of the Holy Spirit just took control of the church today and our country today and just moved us into the, into the, into the presence of God and the purposes of God? Now, Isaiah 59, 19, it's in your outline, says, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up or lift up a standard against him. And we've mentioned this already, that really the comma is in the wrong place. It really should say, when the enemy comes in, comma, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Now, to bear this out in the Amplified Translation, which is also, I think, we'll, we'll have on the screen here, it says, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. Actually, what Isaiah is prophesying, if you read that entire chapter, is in the last days prior to the coming of the Lord, because as we get into Isaiah 60, we start getting into the messianic prophecies of Christ and all those things. Isaiah 59 is saying that in the last days, there is going to be an increased knowledge of who Jesus is and what the gospel is, and it's going to be from the west to the east, there is going to be this amazing move of God. Well, I want to be a part of that. Amen? I, I am optimistic. I am not pessimistic. I know a lot of people are saying it's getting worse and worse and eat more evil and more evil. I get that. But on the other hand, the Bible also tells us in Isaiah, when there is darkness, even gross darkness in the land, arise and shine for your glory has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The darker it gets in the world, the brighter it's going to be in the church. And God is going to send an end-time revival as a witness of the gospel before Jesus comes and before history wraps up as we know it. Amen? And so the Amplified Bible translates, translates verse 19 this way, So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun, for He shall come in like a narrow rushing stream which the breath of the Lord drives, overwhelming the enemy. Now this gives a completely different um, uh, spin on that particular scripture that what the, the Lord is saying is when the enemy comes in and he's doing all of his stuff, and how many of you would say the enemy is really working overtime around the world today with some of the evil that is happening and some of the immorality that's taking place around the world and even in our own land? But when we see that happen, we shouldn't despair because God has a remedy. And you know what the remedy is? It's a, a mighty moving, a torrential river that's going to be released uh, called the Holy Spirit that is prophesied also in Joel that in the last days I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. 
And God has a flood that he is wanting to send to this world that will move everything downstream that needs to be moved downstream and will empower his people and empower his church to do great things in these last days. Amen. Sure, give, give the Lord a praise. I believe he will overwhelm the enemy. I love that where it says that the Spirit of God will overwhelm the enemy. Now, what I want to talk to you about is, is the Holy Spirit today and how that He is the key to the overcoming and overwhelming life and the overflowing life that we need today. If you are struggling in your Christian life, can I just encourage you, you need to check, you need to check your spiritual tank. You may be low on the Holy Spirit. He's available to every one of us, and He wants to do in your life more than we're even desiring Him to do. But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is essential to every part of our Christian life. That's in your outline. He's essential to every part of our Christian life. Now, Zechariah 4, 6 is on the, uh, on the stone, uh, on the cornerstone of our church. When He dedicated the church, we put this scripture out there. It says, uh, so he answered and said to me, the word of the Lord is to Je Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Israel when they were rebuilding Israel in that day and time. And he said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel and some of those who are trying to build the work of God in their day had become discouraged. They'd gotten to a place where they just didn't seem like they were able to move forward They'd kind of gotten halfway into the program of God, and then the wheels started coming off, and they were feeling discouraged. Can I ask you, have you ever gotten into your Christian life or you gotten into what you're doing for God, and uh, you have got to a place where you just feel like, I can't move forward, I can't move backward, I just feel like I'm stuck right here, I'm kind of in a tough place? I believe sometimes God allows us to get to those places so that we realize that we're not going to be able to do the work of God or the purpose of God in our own strength. We cannot do it with our own ability, our own power, our own thinking, or our own resources. If the work of God could be done without God, we wouldn't need God. Amen? It can't be done without Him. And so this is where Zerubbabel was, and they had tried their best. They had done all that they could do, and it's commendable. We should give God our very best and try to be, do everything excellent as we can. But there comes a place when we realize that even our best is not sufficient, that our, uh, that our strength uh, becomes uh, to an end, that there's nothing that we can do. But I want you to know that is when God does His best work. Amen? When we come to the end of ourselves, that's where God can kick in and do what we couldn't do on our own. And so the Holy Spirit uh, was encouraging Zerubbabel and says, listen, Zerubbabel, you're not going to be able to do this work by your own might or by your own power, but we're going to get it done by the Spirit of the Lord. Hey, amen. It's the Spirit of the Lord that is essential in, in our Christian life. Let me just say this. You can't even get saved without the Holy Spirit drawing you to Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? When you got saved, the Holy Spirit drew you. He awakened you that you needed a Savior. And sometimes, you know, that's, that's, that's the biggest work that God does, I believe, is, is uh, really uh, working in the heart of that sinner and bringing them to a place where they realize, I need to come to Calvary, I need to be saved, I need to be redeemed, and He makes it real. And then, not only does the Holy Spirit reveal Christ to us and we become saved, then He empowers us. Uh, he fills us with His own power, and so when when we uh, need to live out the Christian life, can I just tell you this if you haven't discovered it? You cannot live the Christian life on your own. In fact, the Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible. <laughs> you can't do it on your own. You have to have the Holy Spirit help you. You know, I remember before I got saved, I was a teenager. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to read the Bible. I didn't want to pray. I, I didn't want to be a missionary. I didn't want to tell anybody about Jesus. I, I wanted just to have a good time and chase girls. That's what I wanted to do back in those days, you know. But then I got saved, and Jesus became real to my heart. All of a sudden, I wanted to read a Bible. I started, and I couldn't lay it down. I mean, I began to read the Bible. I began to underline things in the Bible. I began to pray. 
I remember one night I was praying for my family down on my knees in the bed bedroom in the up, that upper bedroom that old farmhouse and I was praying and I'd kind of gotten carried away I didn't realize I was making so much noise and all of a sudden my dad who was in the north bedroom said Douglas quit all that mumbling and gumbling you're doing in there and go to bed I need to get some sleep well you know I went from not wanting to pray to where you know my dad had to kind of say hey we're trying to sleep in this house and you're having a prayer meeting what changed? You know what changed? The Holy Spirit had gotten on the inside of me, and He had awakened a desire in me to read His Word and to pray and seek God, and I began to witness to all my friends at school and started a Youth for Christ when I was in high school, and 20 kids in high school got saved. Four of us went into full-time ministry. I did not do that. You know who did that? It was the Holy Spirit that was in me, and I was just trying to obey what He wanted me to do. And I tell you what, if you will allow the Holy Spirit to lead your life, you will live an overflowing life. But if you try to live the Christian life in your own strength, you will tank. You will fail. You will crash. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Amen? We need Him. And He has come to reveal Christ. He's come to empower us to live for Him. And I want you to know, so many times we could almost rewrite this Scripture or re, uh, requote this Scripture in our churches today, and we would say, it's by might, it's by power, and it's not by my Spirit, saith the church. Because we go around thinking that we're so smart, we know how to build the church, we know how to put all of our programs together, we know uh, how we need to do the light show and the smoke show and all the different things now to track people in. Can I just say here, and, and I'm, I'm not against this trying to be excellent, I'm not against this trying to be relevant, I know this is not 1959, this is 2019, there, things change, I get that. But on the other hand, let me tell you something that we need to really understand. All of those things are just decorating, uh, you know, are decorations. But the real thing is bringing people into a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? They need to be saved. They need to be filled with the Spirit and empowered with the same Holy Spirit that empowered the early church. Now, I'm preaching a little better than you're helping me out up here, but I still love you, Okay. Because this is really the truth. God needs to send a flood in these days of His Holy Spirit because people are hungry for a real experience with God. Now, I want to I say something, and I hope you don't take it wrong because I'm not trying to be judgmental or, or an elitist or something like that. But I tell you, I think it makes a difference where you go to church. And I think you ought to go to a church that is open to the moving and the gifts of the Holy Spirit because that is the biblical norm for church. We're living in, in a day, even in Assemblies of God churches, and I'm here again, I'm not, I don't have a bone to pick with anybody. I'm not trying to put anybody down. Where we almost treat the Holy Spirit like He is our weird uncle, and we're, we don't want anybody to meet Him, you know, so we put Him off in a closet somewhere, and I'm thinking how shameful that is for the church now, I know that sometimes when you talk about the Holy Spirit, people get a little nervous because, you know, there's some weird weirdos and some weird things that happen, weird Willie. I, sorry, Willie, not you. Okay, there, there are some weird things that happen, and people go, oh, what, but if that's the Holy Spirit, count me out, you know. Uh, I, I remember our superintendent saying one time that he was in a meeting where some guy got up and ran over and jumped into a, a block wall, just jumped into a block wall. It knocked him out, stunned him. He fell to the ground, you know. And somebody went up and said to him, he said, why did you do that? He said, I thought the Holy Spirit told me to do that. And he said, well, what, did God speak to you when you were laying there on the ground? He said, yeah. He said, what did the Lord say? He said, don't do that again. <laughs> so, so I, guess, I, I guess he needed that lesson. I don't know. So there can be some people that maybe get a little bit, you know, over the top or whatever, but let me tell you what, we can handle that. That's what spiritual leaders are for, right? Somebody gets out a little line. So, you know, do you know this? Sometimes a person's heart can be right, but they can just go a little bit, they get a little bit into the fleshly realm or into their own realm. That can happen, right? But you can't throw the whole baby out with the bathwater, 
Because I'm telling you what, the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit is desperately needed in the world we're living in today, more so than maybe any other time in history. We need a new and a fresh and an authentic move of God that empowers and enlivens the church that we can rise up and be the, the people of God God wants us to be. We should be laying hands on the sick and seeing them recovered right out in Walmart, amen, or right out in, in Panera or wherever you're at. We ought to be having prayer meetings on sidewalks where we're seeing people healed of cancer and heart disease and all these things because Jesus said, greater works will these will you do than, than I've done for I'm going to my Father and I will send the Comforter. And that Holy Spirit that, that was on Jesus is upon every believer and every one of us can do the things that Jesus did, not because it's us, but it's by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. We can do it, and that's what God is wanting to do in these last days. And if I was the enemy, and thank God I'm not, but if I was the enemy, what I would try to do is I would try to rob the church of its power source. I would try to take every weapon away from the church that is effective that I could and make the church weak and anemic and more man-centric than anything else. And to me, that's exactly what the enemy has done. And I'm not making a, a, a cry out here for weirdness, but I am making a cry out for authentic Holy Spirit moving like he moved in the book of Acts. You can't read through the book of Acts without seeing the Holy Spirit almost in every paragraph. And, and the, the, the apostle said, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit that we do this. Or it says, then they were led of the Holy Spirit to go here and preach. And then, or the Holy Spirit gave them discernment in this area, in that area. And I want you to know the Holy Spirit is essential to every part of the Christian life. And if you're not experiencing the joy that you once had in your life, hear me, as a Christian, it's because you've allowed the power of the Holy Spirit to get too low in your life. Amen? He wants to give you that running over experience today and every day. Somebody say it, that you're telling it right, Pastor. Come on. I'm telling it right. Isn't that true? Amen. He is essential, and you can't, you can't live the Christian life on empty. You need more of Him. Now, secondly, the Lord desires that everyone, somebody say everyone, that everyone would have a deep and over, an overflowing experience with the Holy Spirit. God desires that, that you would have that deep, overflowing experience. It just boggles my mind, you know, uh, when, I, when I first got saved, I was a, a, as a Methodist. I'm not against the Methodists. I thank God for my heritage. I at least learned a lot of Bible, uh, Bible stories and, and different things in Methodism that have stayed with me my whole life. But I tell you what, I got into a Spirit-filled church and got filled with the Holy Spirit. It so revolutionized my life. It made the Word become real. And, and you know, I couldn't even hardly say Jesus without crying. You know what I'm saying? Just... The presence of the Lord so real and so wonderful and that I had that deep overflowing experience with the Holy Spirit. I am so thankful for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and for being able to pray in tongues because so many times we don't know how we should pray about a situation or our own life. And isn't it wonderful to be able to pray in the Holy Spirit? There was a young evangelist that was praying in the Holy Spirit and he was spending about an hour praying in the Holy Spirit. And the enemy said to him one day, he said, you're being foolish. You don't even know what you're saying. You're praying in a language you don't understand, and uh, you're just wasting your time. And so the thought dawned to him upon him, man, if the devil's coming after me that hard for praying for one whole hour in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to increase it to two hours a day. And he began to pray two hours a day in the Holy Spirit, and God began to give him revelation and opened up all kinds of things out of the Word to him. And all of a sudden, his evangelistic ministry just, just began to erupt, and that young man's name was Kenneth Hagin. Isn't that something? And for two, and, and there may be some things about his theology that you may not like and I may, may not like, but I tell you what, that man made an impact on the kingdom of God because he, he developed a deep, overflowing relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, come on. Some of us, now we're Pentecostal, we're Spirit-filled. That means we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a prayer language and, and uh, glossolalia and all the theological terms that are there. But it's really just getting connected to the very best prayer partner you will ever have in your life. 
who knows the will of God and knows the purposes of God in your life. And as you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to ask you something that might embarrass you a little bit, but I'm going to ask you, how much time do you, Spirit-filled believer, how much time do you really pr- you spend every day praying in the Holy Spirit? I want to encourage you. I want that to soak in a little bit because I'm telling you, the enemy doesn't want you praying in the Spirit. And he'll try to divert your time. And, but I'm telling you what, what's wonderful about praying in the Holy Spirit is you can be driving down the road. Keep your eyes open, please, okay? Watch the traffic. But uh, you can pray in the Holy Spirit as you're driving to work or driving out to Lowe's to get some stuff or getting groceries or whatever you're doing. You can, you can fill that car, make it a prayer mobile, and just pray in the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit pray through you. One of our own deacons, Jamie Snoke, uh, gave this testimony last Wednesday night. Jamie, you're, you're here, aren't you, somewhere? I saw Russ. Okay, she gave the testimony that she had had a little maybe TIA, a little mini stroke, not really sure what happened. They did all the tests and, and uh, on her to find out what was going on, and she was in, uh, in her, um, oh, come on down here. You can tell this better than I can tell it. Give Jamie a hand as, she, as she's coming on down here. We got time for this, right? Look at your neighbor and say, we got time. We got time. We got, we got time to hear a good word from the Lord, right? Come on up here. Tell them about that prayer thing. Okay, so long story short, in the hospital, I got moved upstairs and admitted to a room. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. Russell took off and headed back home. The nurse left me. She said, you've got your heart monitor on. You're going to be fine. She said, here's your call button. And she turned off the light and left the room. I'm in the hospital room, and I'm still not kind of right in the head yet. And all I could think is, I need somebody to pray for me. I need, I need somebody to pray for me, but it's 4 in the morning. I'm not going to wake anybody up at 4 in the morning to pray for me. And in that moment, I was just overwhelmed with this sweetness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I am with you. And it was just such a loving thing at that moment. And then, you know, the best way I can describe it is he took me to a place that I feel like was maybe like over the Atlantic Ocean. I was looking out, and I could see people all over the world. Like, I mean, I could see the Philippines. I could see India. I could see the United Kingdom in these places. And that's why the geographical spot makes sense to me of where I was looking at this from. And I could see these people, and there were thousands of people praying in the Spirit. And it sounded like a concert of prayer going up. And he said, all of these people are praying for you in the Spirit right now. Fast forward several hours later, all my tests are negative, and I'm fine. Praise God. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? Did you ever think about that? That when you're praying in the Spirit here in Decatur, Illinois, you might be praying for somebody in Indonesia or somebody in Japan or somebody in China or whatever because the Holy Spirit is praying through you the things that need to be prayed. So when you're praying in the Spirit, now we we should pray with our own understanding as well too. I understand that we have to have a balance. We need to pray in our own understanding, but then also we need to pray in the Spirit. And I'm just saying, come on, church, if we're going to be Pentecostal, let's be Pentecostal. Let's be Spirit-filled. Let's let the gifts of the Spirit work in us and through us because we will not know till we get to heaven what good God did through our lives when we're praying in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we won't, They won't know that they didn't know that they were praying for Jamie. You don't know who you're praying for, but I tell you what, the Holy Spirit is at work in all of our lives when we yield to Him. Amen? The Bible says, Jesus said, it's in your outline, on the last and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood up and shouted. The only time in Scripture where Jesus shouts. He shouted. They didn't have PAs back there. Here, can you imagine, here is Israel just filled with throngs and throngs of people for this festival day. And he shouts out, if you are thirsty, come to me and drink. Have faith in me and you will have life-giving water flowing from deep inside you. Just as Jesus, as the Scripture says, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit who would be given to everyone that had faith in Him. The Spirit had not yet been given to anyone since Jesus had not yet been given His full glory. So in John 7, 37, in the King James, or New King James, it says, Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And this spake He of the Spirit. God wants you and I to live this life filled with, flowing with, obedient to the moving of the Holy Spirit in our life. Amen? 
We need to quit depending upon our own thinking and our own thoughts and our own ways and our own strength. Uh, as much as we do, those have their place. Those can be given to God. They can be yielded to God. But we need to listen to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to position us and empower us and do works through us every day that we're living. And we can begin by praying in the Spirit. Amen? And then as we pray in the Spirit, as the Holy Spirit gives you something that you're to do or gives you assignment, then you step out and do that assignment. It might be calling somebody. It might be uh, starting a, a prayer ministry. It might be starting a small group. I don't know what it'll be. Uh, but if we will allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us, and Jesus said, out of your inner being will flow rivers. Isn't that wonderful? Hear it again. It's overflowing. Not one river. One river would be pretty good. But it said rivers of living water. Are you getting the experience that God wants you to enjoy? We're on our way to heaven, and we should be enjoying the trip. Amen? But you're not going to make it if you're dried up in a dusty, cranky old Christian. You know, you know some, people, some people, you know what's happened? They just dried up. Anybody ever been around a person like that? Keep your hand down because they'll think, they'll think you're talking about them. Man, I tell you what, we need that flood of the Holy Spirit to come along and to where you're just moving in His power and moving in His grace and everything is up to date. And I want you to know God has that for you. God wants that for you. And you can walk in it every day if you'll determine in your heart that I'm not stepping out of my house until the Holy Spirit intersects my life. And I'm going to pray in the Spirit all day long. And I'm going to have fellowship, sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to release those rivers of living water that are in me. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm preaching myself happy. I, come along with me, will you? Praise God. You can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. We can't. You know, back in the days when they had uh, the, the clipper ships, um, uh, you know, back in those days, uh, that was, uh, you know, Paul, you remember when they had the clipper ships, right? Back then, oh, okay. I was doing so good right till then, I don't know. But anyhow, there were places in the, in the ocean where the trade winds cease. And uh, it was uh, that they tried to make sure they didn't get there because you could be in the lull for weeks because the wind quit blowing. And if there was no wind, guess what? That ship is not moving. And people could actually run out of all of their resources and their goods and their supplies and actually die on those ships because the ship wouldn't move. And they would put out every sail that they could, hoping that just a little gust of wind would come and move them back into the trade winds where they could, they could get going. Well, you know what? That is a picture of the church, and it's a picture of every Christian life. I tell you what, we can't move and do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit blowing that wind into our sails. Amen. But I tell you what, when he is moving and when that wind is blowing, that rushing mighty wind, I'm telling you what, we can do some great things for God, right? So our, our prayer ought to be, Lord, let the wind of the Spirit, let the wind of the Spirit move the church where it needs to go. Now, lastly, the Lord's promise that it is in the last days his Spirit would be poured out upon all people, upon every ethnic group, upon every economic group, upon every person. Joel chapter 2 says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will preach. That's what the, what the word prophesy means. So if you have a hard time with women preachers, you've got a problem with the word. That's quiet. Amen. Um, William Booth, who started the Salvation Army, used to say, Some of my best men are women. And they say from history that his, his wife was a better preacher than he was. You know what it is? The last days, the whole body of Christ is going to be involved. And I tell you what, it's not a man or a woman who's really preaching anyhow. It's the Holy Spirit that's preaching through a man or a woman. Amen. The real preacher is the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Amen. Oh, my gosh. I got, I'm chasing too many bunnies here. All right. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my man maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. We're living in those days right now. The Holy Spirit is being poured out upon 
the church again and again. We're living in that wonderful age of the Holy Spirit, and God wants us to be filled and refilled and restored. And if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, my advice to you today is on this Sunday morning, get filled with the Holy Spirit. If you haven't been using your prayer language, I want to encourage you, uh, dust off that gift like Paul wrote to Timothy, uh, stir up the gift that is within you on the laying on of hands, begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. Come out on Wednesday nights, pray in the Spirit with us. We're going to have 120 people in our 120 fellowship. I'm prophesying right now. We're going to have 120 people at least coming out on Wednesday nights to pray. We can give God an hour to pray. We can pray in the Spirit. There's great things. We had a wonderful prayer meeting Sunday night, or Wednesday night. Everybody got prayed for. It was a great time. Come on, church. We can't move anywhere without the Holy Spirit working in our life the way He really wants to. Amen? Amen. I, I know.